So I'm delighted now to be joined by Kevin Brady and Angus Callanan just to look at the Galway Senior Hurling uh, squad for the 2023 season. Uh, they are now into the World Cup final, which is going to be played as a double up with the first round of the league against uh, Wexford next weekend down there uh, on the 4th of February. Um, just before we do get into it, uh, don't forget that the Backdoor GA podcast for 2023 is now brought to you by Steve Motor Group for your personalised vehicle shopping experience. Find out more at stevemotorgroup.ie. Before we get into the uh, squad, lads, it just doesn't feel right if we don't, I suppose, touch on the Laker Gale Thursday night, uh, considering it was uh, Joe Canning's Laker Gale. Again, just coming to you first, it was a really well like put production uh, together you could say like just from Everton like from Joe I suppose Joe starting his career club career out especially when he was only 15 and a line that kind of stuck with me Maddie Murphy saying um if you're not playing for your senior club team you're no good to me yeah I, I recall Maddie Murphy saying that as well <laughs> it was one of his famous lines he must have used with every age group but um yeah, look, I mean, from from eight or nine years of age, there was there was talk going around that there was this guy coming. Um, you know, he was playing centre back at under twelve or something and and scoring everything for his team. So um it was flagged way out that, that this guy was coming and it's it's heartening to see, and he mentioned it a lot, you know, that there was huge hype. And he was able to live up to it, you know, uh, and the pressure that must have been on him. And, you know, virtually every time he he delivered, like, so, yeah, just to go back, it, it was a fabulous production. I, I really enjoyed it. And um, I think, you know, it's something that Galway people, as well as Joe himself, can be proud of. When did you first come aware of Amigas? Uh, well, it was it was around, but it was 12, 13, you know, the, the vibes were coming out from, we were, you know, you would have had a couple of Pertumna boys on, around the place and they were mentioning this fella, Joe. It was always just, Joe is coming, wait till Joe comes. Um, so I suppose it was around that, when I was around 18, 19, you heard of this fella coming and that he was, he was going to be something special. And Kevin, to bring you in here, uh, with Everton and his performances and what he scored and he's often talked about it before the pressure he, he had to deal with but I think it was a lot more eye-opening for everyone watching the actual pressure that Joe Canning had to deal with as a hurler. Yeah, he had huge pressure but he had to live up for Ali and <clears throat> Davy and all of them but I can just touch on Angus's point. First time I was I heard of Joe was when I was with the Galway Miners we got met in Loch Grey and we picked the lads up in Port Tumna and we were heading to Thurles. I don't know, was it a challenge match or what we were playing? But we were 17, 18 at the time. Myself and Ivan were great friends. Joe's brother, you know, he was in goal for us. And he sat in beside me and Joe was outside the bus. And he was nearly bigger than me at the time. He was 11 or 12. And Ivan said to me, he said, see that young fellow there? He said, that's Joe, the younger brother. He said, he's going to be the next Joe Coney. I thought it was a fair statement, you know, because... The cannings would be very reserved. It wouldn't be like that. And that was the first time I'd seen Joe. He says he's going to be the, the bee's knees. It turned out he was, you know, he was phenomenal. I never seen it like him, ever. Could you tell nearly getting on the bus that day and even when you're down at a match and he's messing around and he's only young that there was something in this guy straight away? Yeah, well, he was he was brought up in a family of Ireland and, you know, I suppose, like... He had a great chance, but he also had the likes of Ollie and Davy and um, the older guys to ground him. You know, he wasn't like Ollie was. Ollie was a superstar in corner forward before he ever went back corner back, and Joe was just starting the knee at Ivan, and um, so he wasn't going to get ahead of himself. He's he's his ears are going to be clipped very young. You know, you keep your feet on the ground. Your club is before your county. That's the thing I loved about him. Or Tumna was everything and still is, and. It's just a, it's a huge, huge credit to him and his family that he was able to put his club before everything. You know, when he when he was called in with Lockdown in 2016 or 2017, I was in there as well and Angus was there at the time, or 26 or 20 or 
zero six or zero seven, and he wouldn't come in, you know. And I thought it was a great move. You know, he was protected. He knew what was coming down the line. He didn't go in there, and um, he reaped the rewards, you know. Just from both of you, you're in around that stage, and Joe Canning doesn't come in. Like, Angus, what, what, what are you thinking there? <laughs> Being honest, it, it, you, you know, it, it wasn't. It was probably wasn't handled the best, you know, because. Look, Nan kept saying, oh, we want him in. And Joe kept saying no. And it was kind of, there was a bit of a hangover there from the county final in, at the end of 06, you know, and, and the incidents that happened. And, uh, you know, it was, it was never said, but people kind of thought that, you know, that was sort of the reason he wasn't getting involved because there was possibly Lockery lads there or whatever at the time as well. And um, look, I don't think it helped the set up, being honest. But I suppose for himself personally, it certainly it certainly benefited him in the long run that you know he got that year out and and you know was able to build himself up and get get himself ready for senior and should look when he came along then came with a bank you know. The one thing when he does come in senior, uh, Kevin, like that performance on the Rocco Sullivan, and uh, he references it, it's one of the worst things he's ever done because I suppose there was just such an expectation there probably among supporters that Joe Canning was going to be like this every day well that's it you know um, you're only as good as your last game and when you score 212 if you only score 211 the day after you've gone back a bit but it goes back to the point of when you see Clunan you know Eugene um, when they played uh, the clear champions with Wolf Tones in the All-Ireland final I think and he was on Brian Lohan and something similar he cleaned Lohan which was rarely done when Joe Canning cleaned the rock it was rarely done um, but Joe was so well able to look after himself. Like Joe at eighteen was six foot two or whatever he was, and he was a big, big guy. You know, he had no real development more to do. It was just a matter of keeping his um, just mentally developing. So, you know, he had it all. He really, really had it all. And um, it'll be a long time before we ever see Anthony like him in Galway again. And on that. Um... Ingus, he references during the podcast, or not the podcast, but the Lake Regale, that Galway at that at that time probably weren't good enough. And when you look back on it, would you would you tend to agree? Well, you'd have to say yes when you don't win it, then you know. Um, being honest about it, they were the facts. You know, we didn't. We had a small bit of success in zero ten, you know, but. 07, 08, 09, 11. You know, they were lean enough kind of years, really, in terms of performances. It just there wasn't consistency there. I think, you know, I'd say there, there, there definitely was the talent there, but just wasn't on a consistent enough basis. You know, there was one good win and then fall down the next day, you know. Um, so I suppose you'd have to you'd have to say he's probably right in, in some respects that you know we weren't good enough, the proof is in the pudding, and there was no silverware to show for it. And is there anything you can put the finger on now looking back on that inconsistency? Like, was it maybe after Owen, maybe starting to believe your own hype? Or? Possibly could be some of that in it, yeah. Um, it's, you know, when you're, when you're inside of it, it's kind of hard to, to have a helicopter view of it to see what the main problems were. You're so engrossed in it. But um, look, at there's lots of different reasons. You, you know, you could you could put your finger on, but at the end of the day, you have to move on. Um, it, was, it was, as Joe referenced himself, it was kind of when Anthony came in that that things started to change a bit for, for the goal hurler. So I suppose maybe there's something in that. And just on Anthony there, Kevin, um, like it was extremely honest and open because like it wasn't a great time, I suppose, around Galway Hurling when that did happen with Anthony Cunningham and the players kind of, I suppose, voted with that lack of confidence in management, and then Anthony Cunningham was ultimately lost his job, and there wasn't really a good vibe, you could say, after all that did happen. No, there wasn't, and there was a lot of bad blood in Galway for a long time about it. There were certain players blamed, and Anthony was blamed. You know, I remember. You know, club man at times your father was dropped and you know shouldn't have been dropped after a good year and there was a lot of other players you know Joe Gantley and these kind of players that were sort of 
brushed aside very quickly that had more to give they felt in Galway hurling and they just felt they were wronged. But I always come back to it, you know, have a look at yourselves, have a look at the individual um, collectively as a team, you know, don't be throwing a manager under the bus. If a manager is not good enough, you know, he should be able to see himself. He has his chance to walk away. But, you know, Anthony Cunningham brought Galway a long way. You know, he really did. He turned the corner. Um, personally, he wouldn't have been my own type of guy. He was confrontational. That's fine. I'm only saying it as I see it. A lot of the guys liked that. Other guys didn't like it. But, um, you know, he really laid down the marker, I felt. You know, he, he brought really a bit did. of steel, didn't he, Kevin? To, I suppose, he did, yeah, yeah. And you could see it on the line. Like, for years, how many times did Cody bully the line, you know? And the last time we seen someone bully the line was Loch Nan in 95, 96, up along there. Then you had Cody come in. He bullied the line for years. And, like, when you see your manager backing you on the line, it gives you the extra 10%, no matter what. And the first one to challenge Cody was Cunningham. You know, that, that historic bit on the line where they wouldn't shake hands and... You know, there was a real, I have an interviewer here with me, you know, they have a real, they have a real, um, you know, it sort of gave the guys a lift going into the dressing room that day. You know, we're not going to stand down. We're going to go toe to toe with them. And, you know, when Anthony then left and or pushed out, whatever it may be, then Michal came in, you know, and he challenged them as well. And bit by bit, they got over the line in 2017. But I thought there was more in them after 2017, to be honest. Yeah, I think I think some of them will look back there and maybe, especially 18, feel like mm. it was one that they could have added to. Just to finish on it, I thought the most, uh, I suppose, you could say interesting, funny thing, Angus, but when I suppose Joe went out back again, uh, starts poking the slitters out, the dog runs back with all the slitters to Joe, but the dog doesn't run back with all the slitters to the rest of the cannings. I know, yeah. I even had a funny mention in the pub there, as right, saying that he was the golden child, and then Joe came along, and it was like the rest of them didn't exist anymore. Um, but yeah, no, you could you could see the the family was was huge to him, and, and um, certainly you know the, it, it was quite touching and emotional when he had to discuss his own mother. Like, and uh, it was great for him and great for his family that she was there at his greatest day of all. You know. Absolutely, and uh, just just what a career as well, and for Joe Canning, a well put together uh, production. Our main focus, though, lads, the Goa Senior Hurling squad at the minute. Um, three wins from three in the Walsh Cup over Antrim, um, Westmead, and Dublin. Does see them into this Walsh Cup final now as a double up. Um, where they play Wexford on 4th February in the Open Round League and the Walsh Cup final. Kevin, it, it is very early in the year so far, but so far the signs are very good. Like, oh, I have been putting out relatively strong teams. They have, yeah. Um, you can really start to see Shep and Mould his he's way now. Like, just going back to the semi final last year against Limerick, they had three to the old Kilkenny, they were hunting in packs. Like we just seem to have lost average them. intent about them coming this year now. Um, eat too much on into the Walsh Cup, but at the same time, I think it's a great thing. We have a double header in in um Wexford Park in two weeks' time. I think it was a great idea to to double it up for the first round of the league. You know, it'll give it'll give. The Galway lads a huge or Shefflin a huge insight to the mentality of the lads, you know. Um, to be down in Wexford Park, huge crowd down there, away from home, um, out of Crow Park as well, you know, just to see what they're really made of, you know. And if he can pull maybe two guys into the team this year, I think he won't be far off it, you know. Yeah, he's used something like 35 lads in the league or, you know, huge numbers, which is great. But I think if he can pull maybe two, three max, he'll have a right cut of the All Ireland this year. Yeah, it's it's like Angus. It hasn't been maybe a team where you've seen in the past where there's a load of I say youngsters. Like there has been a couple of youngsters, but they've been molded in together with the more experienced players. Yeah, it's typical Cody, really. You know, he'd nearly always have an experienced fella. On each line, with with, with with young lads either side, 
and you know he lets them off like whether they're playing well or playing bad or you know or getting cleaned or whatever they just give them the game you know and eventually see what they're made of because you know you, you throw in young lads I remember the first time we played Kilkenny Colin Finley was playing and and uh, he got cleaned he was cleaned like and and you saw then the career he went to go and have so it's it's great that guys are given this opportunity as, as Kevin said there like there's 35 different fellas used during the league uh, which is incredible plus most of the time they have been playing the teams the development squad have been playing uh, in the morning beforehand as well so so there's 50 60 guys there probably getting game time um at, at the top level now look Westmead Antrim and a second string Dublin team where nobody's going to get carried away here but um, it certainly can uh, give guys a good exposure to top level hurling, and I suppose no better man than Shefflin and his backroom team to pick out, as Kevin said, one or two maybe there that can can uh, make the difference come you know semi final final stage. Thing is, like we often talk about in Galway, I suppose having this minor success and players coming through. But if you look particularly maybe like from a minor team or two or three years ago, you're having the likes there of Liam Collins, Gavin Lee, Sean O'Hanlon, John Cooney, like Declan McLaughlin, all these players. Now they're they're obviously maybe a few years down the road in their development. Some might even see action this year with the performances they have put in so far. But that that's a positive to see these young players coming through because like you can't really get past the fact that like in Galway, sometimes we have lost some of these players along the way. I agree. I agree. I mean, you know, on average, the statistic, I think, is about if, if you get two fellas from each minor year to make it full as full-time seniors, that's about, that's that's the, the, the average, you know. Um, but going back to Maddie Murphy there earlier on, if you're not doing it for your senior team, most of the guys you mentioned there, are their leading lights or becoming their leading lights for their senior clubs or, or their top team in their clubs. So, um, you know, the standard of Galway club hurling is, is a great shop window for these guys and um, brings them on from minor. And then once they perform for their senior teams, they are getting their chance at, at inter-county senior. So it's good to know that lads know from minor, if I can perform for my club, I'm going to get it. I'm probably going to get a crack here at, at the senior panel. And Kevin, them like as Ing has mentioned there, them them four or five lads like for the clubs have really put in performances, which has which has earned them uh, to be in this position for Galway. Yeah, definitely. I followed uh, the senior championship last year, and it was a massive, massive championship. Um, Lockray for me were the team of the season. Um, everyone expected um, Thomas to go on and win it, and and they did rightly so. They were a serious outfit, but you know, um, Lockray are really coming as well. Um, you know, they have a backroom team there in Loch Grey as good as a county setup, and they're really working hard up there. Um, Cappy Tagler coming, you know, Port Tumley came again, Crawwell, like, and they're taking one or two of these guys um, all of the time in through um, the system. And even the development squad, as Angus said, they're, you know, training the day before and having matches. It's a huge thing for them getting in around the inter county setup, you know, with Shefflin and Joyce and Lally. And, you know, playing with the likes of David Burke and all of these guys, um, letting them back to the clubs, as you said, they mightn't even get game time this year, but they're still county set up um, mentality going back into the club. is only bringing the club onto a different level again, you know, and it's giving them a stepping stone for later on in the year. Because there's one thing about Shefflin, uh, I'll finish the comment on this. He said, like last year, he said he'd be at all the club games, or if he isn't, he has representatives, which is a huge thing, massive, massive thing, you know. The club championship of Galway is savage. And like whether you're in senior A or senior B, there's always a player good enough to represent your county in it, you know. Kevin, you mentioned a player there, David Burke, um, mm. a player who has put in another tremendous shift for St. Thomas's throughout the club championship. There was doubts maybe whether he's going to come back for another year, but how important is it that David Burke is back committing to Galway for another year? Oh, the second I heard it, I was delighted. And I'd be a fan of David. You know, I marked him. I'd have him down him himself and Andy Smith. It's the two toughest I've ever played with. And But David is just a leader around the camp. He's a leader around the Thomas's dressing room, the Galway's dressing room. Um, I don't believe 
Galler would have won an All Ireland in 2017 if he hadn't been captain, and that's a big statement. But I do believe it. I know the respect the guys had for him, um, players had for him, management had for him. He just has that aura in his dressing room, and like Davis still is good enough to play. I feel you know maybe not full 75 minutes now, which is gone to, but I think he's a player that starts and should come off rather than. Um, not start and come on, you know, I believe to have him starting on the field is everything. And, you know, when you have the likes of him, a captain, it would be like Connor Hayes coming to the end as well, you know, bringing in the younger players. You know, they, they look up to them. How important is it for you, Angus, that he's back for another year? Uh, look, I mean, uh, I'm certainly not going to, uh, to to try and tell Dave Burke what to do, but I mean, I think it's, it, it's great. I mean, it's, Look at outside of Joe Canning and maybe one or two others, Dave Burke is in the top five hurlers the guy uh, have ever produced, in my opinion. You know, um, his record speaks for himself. He, he he doesn't say say that much off the field, but he certainly does all his talking on the field. And it was funny when Dave Burke said the last day Joe Canning can be cranky. Well, I can tell you, Dave Burke is fucking twice as cranky uh, when he's playing, uh, and and the standards that he drives at training, you know. Uh, Shefflin will see that, and uh, I think there's, there's there's no drawback from having David Burke involved in the setup. His performance last year against Limerick was was top quality. He was one of Goa's better players in the day, and um, he certainly has plenty to give uh, Goa hurling going forward. Stay on standards, like is he is he pushing everything uh, that like in that training or whether it's a match? Oh, David Burke is as competitive in the warm up as he is in the middle of the match. Like there's just the the level of consistency that he drives for, and and you can see that then with Thomas as well. The level of consistency that they have attained. Um, David Burke it never rests on his laurels. He he is consistently performing at the top level, whether it be a challenge match, a training match, an inter county all Ireland final. He is the man driving the standards. Maybe not necessarily that vocally, um, bits and pieces, but just in his application, the way he applies himself, um, there's no better professional out there, I would say, in, in Galway in the last couple of years. Do you think midfield is still a position for Mingus? Yeah, I think David Burke has been tried half backs, half forwards, corner forwards. I, I maintain midfield is his best position by a mile. Even just that performance, Kevin, last year, like against Limerick, I think that's where everyone showed that, and it emphasised how important that David Burke still is to this goal cause. Oh, well, it was like the old saying, the big player, the big day, you know, let him into the cauldron there of Crow Park. You know, he sets the world alight, and he really does. And I push an Angus point again, definitely in the top five players of all time for Galway. Um, I debate with anybody about that. Um, not just alone his leadership qualities, but just his vision. Like David Burke is a savage. Like he really is. He's that's the word I'd use him. He's a savage out in the field. Not dirty by any matter of means, but t- uh, teak tough. Um, his passing of the ball on the run, left and right, is probably the best I've ever seen. Um, and like you even look at Thomas's, they build everything from the half back line out. David Burke plays as a fourth man in the half back line but yet he ends up with scores. So he does the same with Galway, you know. Can't say enough about him. The league coming around now, lads, um, and we've mentioned with the Walsh Cup and everything with that, Wexford's the first game up, but like if you're looking at the other games in that division, uh, Clare, Cork, Limerick, and Westmead, along with Wexford, like, whatever you can say about it, Angus, it definitely is, you could say, maybe a bit of a stronger group compared to Group B, but like, do, do you still feel the league is treated as seriously as other years? Because in the past, I suppose now with the round robin uh, coming in, maybe the league has been undermined a small bit? Possibly, possibly. I think, um, you know, teams are would be more strategic now about the league in terms of the games that they target rather than going full out to win each and every game. You know, I think Galway will will certainly be targeting this first game. Uh, you know, Cork coming to town then the week after and almost certainly the Limerick game. They have a week off there after the Cork game. You know, if they can get two wins out of them first three games 
Um, I, I don't think I don't think they'll be pushing gung ho to win it out then after that because you know as you said there's a fairly short downtime between the end of the league and the start of the championship so you don't want to be going at your very top end come the end of the league because you know, you, you have a long sprint, as you want to call it, once the championship starts. So it's about time and your run, really. If you look at Limerick the last couple of years, who remembers Limerick's performance in the last couple of years? Like, you know, but everybody remembers what they did in the championship. So I think Gaul will be looking along the same type of lines there that, you know, pick a couple of games that you really want to perform in and challenge yourself. But I don't think winning the league is the ultimate goal. Is there a danger as well, Kevin? Because everyone will reference Walford last year. Absolutely flying it in the league. Looked like real All-Ireland contenders. Came to the championship and they just looked really off the pitch of things. Yeah, but there was a bit of... There was a bit of a niggle down in Walford as well last year. And Cahill left and he sort of... You know, he knew he was coming back to Tipperary. So I wouldn't write an awful lot about that. But I do know... Um, like the 22nd of April, first round of the championship... Wexford at home, is that correct? Um, that's what Shefflin will be aiming for. Like Angus said, they're one or two wins in the league, try and blood one or two players, um, and have his consistent team for championship, maybe two games, uh, two last games of the league, and really have a go at the championship this year. It's a huge thing to, to win the Leinster championship this year would be massive. Get a bit of silverware, you know, and even the Walsh Cup and the first round of the league next weekend. If you could get a bit of silverware now down in Wakeford Park, I think it'd be massive. It really would. Like as Kevin Kevin is referencing there, Angus, championship is going to be so important for this Galway side. But do you think within their own camp they're thinking it's massive to try and win the Leinster Championship? Because if you're looking at two big challengers for the Leinster Championship, Kilkenny and Dublin, they have new managers coming in. Galway are into their second year, Henry Shefflin. They'll feel maybe they're a bit further down the road to, I suppose, win this Bob O'Keefe this year. I don't think there's any uh, drawback from winning the Leinster title. Uh, you know, you mean you've a more direct route, less games. You get it, get a week off, get time to refresh. So I um, would be very surprised if that's not a goal of this setup that that, that, that they win the Leicester title. Obviously, they'll be taking one game at a time, and, and nothing is easy. But um, you know, it's it's a huge benefit to the guys. A lot of younger guys there that haven't really won that very much with Galway. You know, how many lads are left now of the 2017 team? Like, um, so you know, they mightn't have won that much of Galway. Let them win an Leinster title if they can do it, and it'll benefit the, the the whole setup. Give them a great confidence to go forward and give a right crack then at at the All Ireland Championship. The big thing, the last day, um, which is something that definitely you have to take into account, like, Kevin, it's not as if we're blessed with that many Leinster titles either in Galway, like, from even watching Joe Canning's Laker game. No, we're not. And, like, it's it's like an old, um, it's like your way of saying, oh, sure, if we don't win it, sure, we didn't want to win it. You know, that's rubbish. You want yeah. to win everything. And, like, you go back to Cody, the greatest manager of all time, and Shefflin, you know, he's young entrepreneur. He's in there now. He's seen what it, it meant to Kilkenny. They wanted to win Walsh Cups, leagues, challenge matches, all Ireland's, and that's the Cody mantra. That'll be Shefflin's as well. There's no question about it. So I'll touch back again on the point. To beat Wexford in the, fir- in the first round of the league in the Walsh Cup final, that's mm-hmm. going to be a real, real humdinger now. And the Wal- or the Leinster title, then, that has to be their next goal. You know, there's two big cups given out this year, and the Bob O'Keefe, as you said, and the Lee McCarthy. They'll want to win them. Angus Limerick are obviously the standard bearers, you could say, at the moment. You consider that semi final goal, we would probably feel they were dead, but there was chances. Nick, Nicky Quaid pulled off a remarkable save. But, like, how far away are we from getting to Limerick's level, do you feel? Um, I don't think we're that far away generally. Um, you know, if you if you look back at that match, you know, Galway would have hopefully learned a lot, a lot of harsh lessons from that last 10 minutes in terms of uh, composure. You, you know, Limerick displayed all their, their finest traits when, when the heat was on. 
they were able to remain cool, you know, work their ball through, create their scores. Galway would have had, you know, snapshots, bad wides, losing possession in, in the tackle, things like that. So, you, you know, there isn't a lot that Galway need to change or improve on to be able to be right there at the finish line with Limerick. Um, I think that, you know, if they can get these one or two players that will help off the bench um, and, and hopefully there'll be a lot of lads with, with more game time experience that Galway are no, certainly not far away whatsoever. You know what I mean? Um, you can't, well, last the semi-final last August or whatever is a long time ago now and it'll take a long time to get back up to that level. But I think with, with the management setup they have, the players, Galway are not far off at all. I'll just bring it uh, over to Kevin and then bring it back to Angus. But uh, Kevin, what do we need to do to get to that level? I suppose it's like the last 10 minutes in any any game. Um, you look at Dublin in their prime, uh, Kilkenny in their prime. You know, every team could stick with them for 60 minutes. But it's the last 10, 12 minutes that they feel... Like, mental toughness is one thing, but their physical, physical conditioning is phenomenal, you know. And I believe most counties are catching up with each other now, but Limerick just have a head start on so many people, you know. Um like you look at their driving forces in the field, you know, O'Donovan and O'Donoghue. Like, like they're the driving force of that Limerick team. They're really and truly are. They have the launch pad of their half back line, you know, Burns and and these guys. Um I believe their centre field is 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 everything. If Galway can find um a good eight or nine with Burke or with Ronan Glenn and whoever it might be, um, they have a serious, serious chance. And the last thing on that is the physical I believe Galway are the only team that can physically match Limerick. You know, uh, we're big, big men and we're big, strong men down the middle. Um, Clare nearly had them last year in the drawn match, but couldn't, just couldn't beat them again, you know. You only get one chance at the likes of Limerick. Um, they are the bench zone for every, every team, or the bench guard, I say. But um, looking forward to the year, I think Galway will have a right, right quarter to leave McCarthy. But it's a huge, huge year for Sheffield now and Damien Joyce and and Kevin Lally. They're shrewd operators. They know what they're about. And, like, what what's the area that you feel that can be, I suppose, zoned in on fr from the start of the year, particularly to get across for Henry Shefflin and the guys there, uh, Angus? I don't think there's a particular zone they'll be focusing on. It, it's more the attitude and the style of play. Uh, you know, as as Kevin said earlier, like the, the traits of the old Kenny's work rate turnover. If guys aren't doing that, uh, you know, they, they, they don't be they don't be long be left in there. Um, so I don't. I I just think it, it'll be more the team's attitude, their style of play. The personnel will come and go. You could always get an injury. You can be without a lad. I think it's more about the team, how the team is performing. Um and you know ultimately I suppose it's about getting scores on the board so uh, potentially they'll be looking at that area uh, they seem to be relatively steady at the back and compact Galway so um, maybe they might be focusing on that area but uh, it won't be a razor light focus I don't think to be honest I'll put it to you and then over to Kevin can Galway win the Lee McCarthy this year? Absolutely they have they have the players, they have the manager, they have the facilities. The, the, you know, there's no excuses really. Um, they, they they're really really in the good position to to give it a right crack. Um, it will take a phenomenal performance to overturn Limerick based on their last couple of years, but Galway, as Kevin said, are our best match in my opinion to take them out. And can they reach the Holy Grail, Kevin? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, the hangover of Joe Canning gone. Um, you know, move on now. New era. Still are them guys there. There's a great mix. They have the management. Angus said the facilities, which is huge as well. They have the backing of the board. Um, they're the best supporters in the country. Um, I think they'll have a right, right cut. But the Leinster is huge. You know, they need to get silverware early now. Walsh Cup, Leinster and do a clean sweep. And this is the standards that Sheffield will be setting. And this is why David Burke is back again. 
you know, he knows what it's about and the lads do as well. So, Gal, you go for <laughs> Just to touch uh, then, lads, like looking at maybe new faces who could make, make an impact in this uh, squad. Last year, Angus, he talked there about the backs. We've seen Jack Grealish come in, really kind of cement a, a spot uh, down for himself. We even seen Tiernan Killeen uh, come in in games, and even for Lopre, he really seemed to be stepping up. But maybe from a defensive point of view, like is, is there anyone like standing out for you early on in the season who you feel can make an impact on the side? Well, uh, there's only one player that started all three games so far in the Walsh Cup. Um, so there's probably a good reason for that. Um, Jack Fitzpatrick, I, I think they must be looking at, at Jack as being... Um, Cover there for for the full back line. Uh, so so I suppose if I was to pick out somebody, it'd be based on that. That the guy seemed to be showing a lot of confidence in him, and giving him every opportunity to to try and stake a claim for a place. With Jack Fitzpatrick, like he's such a good hurler, but obviously when you have Di Di Burke in that position, it's it's so hard to get in. And like you can see, they've tried to move Jack Fitzpatrick around, maybe put him in a corner, but. You're probably nearly thinking for Jack Fitzpatrick, he's just such a, a natural fullback. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But the way the game has gone now, I suppose, you know, there's never there's never three fellas in the full forward line anymore. Um, Jack could could be named a cornerback, but ultimately might end up playing fullback with Dahi Mark and another fella, or task to Mark a fella. I mean, Dahi was penciled in for Aaron Galan last year for a lot of the game, you know, who, who wasn't really a full forward or playing full forward that well, named full forward might have been positioned there a bit. So I suppose the, the actual positions don't really matter as much really, that, uh, particularly full forward line and full back line at the moment because um, everybody is is bringing a man out at this stage. So I think it's, it's good to have lads who can play in a number of positions really back there. Do you do you expect Patrick to break through this year? I don't know. I mean, he's he looks like he's going to be given the, every opportunity. I mean, he's shown for his club. He's he's one of the leading lights for them. So um, we'll just have to see how he performs in the league if he if he gets the run now in two weeks and and ultimately that'll be the test whether he he'll make the grade or not. Because as you said, the the Di and and Jack Grealish really put themselves forward last well Dahi obviously always did but Jack did last year so um, the guys pick on form so if, if Jack is performing he'll probably get the run yeah Kevin a player who could return from fitness I suppose defensively as well and could play a major role like obviously it's it's, it's a very strong half back line but you feel that okay. Gawain might make room for him Shane Cooney there um, like he only played I suppose the latter stages for Thomas's, but he, he is coming back now to very, very close to fitness yeah and like I was just going through the team there last year with Grealish and Morrison Cooney Finton Burke like Shane Cooney as well put him in there and Adrian too he's been flying this year you know he's a guy I really like um, went in and out of the boil he knows what it's like to play cornerback he was an unsung hero there in cornerback now they've been brought out to centre back he wouldn't be a young guy now. He'd be in an elder state of the panel, but he still has a leg for it. Um, I like Don Lochier, you know, good hurler. Um, like I said, they've used 35, but going back to the point there, Jack Fitzpatrick, you know, and there's so many more guys you can talk about, but he just hit the point on him. He has started all games. Um, and like Angus said, uh, there's no such thing as a position now. You know, if you can play cornerback, you can play centre field because you have to read the game so well. You have to be able to move the ball from side to side and you have to be so comfortable on the ball, you know. Hurling is nearly like football now. You need, you need to be able to control the game. Around that centre field, that midfield area, last year we seen Ronan Glennon and Tom Monaghan have breakthrough years, you could say, were really impressive throughout the championship along with uh, Davy Burke as well. Um, <laughs> But in, in attack and around the middle third area, Angus, is there anyone jumping out there that you can that could make a difference, do you feel? Um, it wouldn't necessarily be a younger guy, but, but uh, Jason Flynn seems to be back now. You know, he, he was out injured last year for a long time, never really got a crack at it. Um, he certainly has the physique. You know, he's a long time round. Um, obviously, Evan... 
Like Evan is a long time now. Well, he's three or four years knocking around the place. He's been in and out. He's He's been shooting the lights out in Fitzgibbons in any of the Walsh game, cup games he's played for his club. You know, he, he's score, scoring exploits are phenomenal, really. Um, you, you know, the, the, any of the younger guys, the real, real younger guys, I don't feel physically they're going to be able to make the step up. Yes, they'll be on the panel, but you know, your, your Declan McLaughlin's, your Liam Collins's, Mark Kennedy's, I, I think I think it's too early, really. You need guys who have been there two or three years and then been able to to make the breakthrough. So so certainly Evan and I'd hopeful Jason can come back and, and show a lot of form that he, he has. He's going to be a lot in the eleven channel this year early on Watch Cup. He does, he does, yeah, yeah. And you know, Jason is 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 a serious scorer as well. Like he mightn't be a great ball winner, but you know, certainly given the ball, he he will he will make it sing. You know. So um, it'll be interesting, all right, to see where they position him, uh, and very interesting as well where they position Conor Whelan. Also, I think. Ingus, just as a forward, is from last year, is the lack of goals a concern at all? Um, because that game against Kilkenny, they didn't register a goal, and and I suppose you're just thinking like there's been games in the league where it's clicked for Brian Cannon and Conor Whelan, but maybe in championship they haven't been afforded the same space. And there definitely is goals in the squad team. Oh, yeah. I mean, the two boys inside are, are very, very dangerous if they get the right kind of ball. Um, I, I suppose it's just a more matter of working on that, really. I think, Paul, um, teams are not scoring that many goals anymore. The way the setups are, there's always a sweeper. Be different enough score goals, like you know, it, it, it's it's high point scoring game from way out the field that won't limit the All Ireland. It wasn't necessarily goals, so mm. um, I, I I'm not that concerned about it, yeah. really. I think the way the game is going, it is going to be harder and harder to score goals. Um, so but like most counties would, would could only dream of two lads like Brian and Connor inside with the right kind of ball. I mean, they will certainly do damage. Is there anyone you're expecting, I suppose, in attack, Kevin, for you that can can make the difference? I don't think attack was always really our um, Achilles heel. You know, we always had the forwards in Galway. Um, goals, like, um, you'll always find that there'll be more goals sco- scored in the league, you know, where conditions aren't as good and the ball isn't as fast and guys wouldn't be as fit, you know. So I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, Evan Island, for me, you know, he, he shoots the lights out. That's what he's there to do. Uh, you can't blame a guy for not, you know, for scoring so much, even though he might know an awful lot from play. I don't agree with that either. I think he's a class act, you know, TJ Brennan and Don Lushay. There's so many young guys, but they'll have to be used at the right time. For me, the big, big thing for Galway is the centre field. Um, because there's no such thing as a centre field now, you know, it's 45 to 45. So, like O'Donovan and like O'Donoghue were the benchmark of every centre field, the modern centre fielder. So who do you put in there? Do you put two Ian Glynn and two Warriors? They'd be my kind come her ground time if they can get through the league well. They're seasoned campaigners now at this stage and they're physically up for the challenge, you know, put David Burke in there as well. I don't know. I don't know. It, um, the league will tell a lot, but Galway won't be fair off it. You know, you've Cahill Mannion will be inside with the boys and he'll come out and shoot his long range scores as he always does. So um, that's basically it. Kevin, who for you is the most important player for Galway to keep fit in 2023? Oh, Dahi Burke. Dahi Burke, you know, he's he, he's the leader now. Uh, and Connor Whelan, of course. You know, Dahi in the defence and uh, Connor up front. Connor, like his... Connor Whelan started and a few years ago and he was only a small light for that. Like, Connor Whelan, six foot two or three. He's built like a tank. Um, doesn't say a lot in his dressing room, does it all on the field. He takes two guys marking, you know, Angus said they're about the sweeper. Like he takes a sweeper out of the game every time and he brings two with him and he takes them on. So he's huge. Dahi is, you know, picks up Galan anytime he meets him. Um, you know, he took so Seamus Cannon in his pocket a few years ago. Cannon scored one, two after the first four minutes or one one. Dahi ended up getting man at the match. That's the kind of leaders you want. So them two, keep them fit, you know, and rotate your team around them. Who, who do you feel is key to keep fit this season? Exactly the same fellow as Kevin said. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, 
you know, I mean, was it was it last year? Connor pulled a hamstring or something there in one of the Leinster Championships, and it was like a death in the family. They're on go, you know, <laughs> the vibes that went around. Um, like you've talked to any fellow that's ever marked him, they just have horror stories about Connor Whelan. He just. <laughs> It's it's not so much what he'll do when he has the ball. It's nearly as worse when you have the ball because of the work rate that he has. And the power of him, was he? Yeah, like, you know, yeah. he's just, he's like a little badger on the ground. He just will not move. <laughs> yeah. like. So I, I think he's just vital for Goa because of what he offers. And I suppose, yes, his scoring ability, but, it, but it's more his work rate. that Like the ball will not come out easy when he's in there. You can be guaranteed of it. So I think him and I, there is there is other important guys for Galway, Joe Cooney. You know, if you can get Connor Cooney back on, Cahill Mannion is certainly important, Paul Mannion, but I think Connor Whelan up front and Dahi really give you a good footing either end of the field, you know. Yeah, here's hoping uh, the last predictions are spot on uh, for the uh, year ahead and that we'll be back celebrating later on in the year. Uh, if these predictions do come true but there's definitely huge optimism and hope this year uh, for the Galway senior herders with the more experienced players and uh, the younger talent coming through as well and um, don't forget that this podcast is sponsored by uh, Steve Motor Group Clare Galway supplying a wide variety of new and used vehicles at stevemotorgroup.e take the work out of care shopping uh, I'd just like to thank Angus and uh, Kevin for coming on the podcast that's all on the podcast for this week and uh, we'll be back uh, next week with another podcast thanks for listening Cheers, Paul.